Hello and happy Friday. We're gonna jump right into the pledge and the motto and get started with uh, finding out what Lavender's plan is for the trench bowl and the newt and the water. Salute and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And here we go. And begin. We are students at Peter G. Shields. We believe in kindness. We are responsible. We are persistent. We are respectful. We are bucket fillers. We drop acts of kindness into everything we do. We are Peter J. Shields. All right, my kiddos, let's get started. Let's see what we got going. All right, got my handy dandy glasses. I'm gonna turn that camera a little bit because I like the books in the background too. Okay, so remember Lavender caught her newt. So it says the next day she carried her secret weapon to school in her satchel. She was tingling with excitement. She was longing to tell Matilda about her plan of battle. In fact, she wanted to tell the whole class, but she finally decided to tell nobody. It was better that way because then no one, even when put under the most severe torture, would be able to name her as the culprit. Lunchtime came. Today it was sausages and baked beans, Lavender's favorite, but she couldn't eat it. Are you feeling all right, Lavender? Miss, Str Miss Honey asked from the head of the table. I just had such a huge breakfast, Lavender said. I really couldn't eat a thing. Immediately after lunch, she just dashed off, excuse me, to the kitchen to found one of the trench bowls, famous jugs. It was a large bulging thing that made it a blue glazed pottery. Lavender filled it half full of water and carried it together with the glass into the classroom and set it on the teacher's table. The classroom was still empty. Quick as a flash, Lavender went and got her pencil box from her satchel, slid the lid open just a tiny bit, and the newt was lying quietly still. With great care, she held the box over the neck of the jug and pulled the lid fully open and tipped the newt in. There was a pop, pop, and it landed in the water. Then it thrashed around wildly for a few seconds before settling down. And now to make the newt feel more at home, Lavender decided to give it the pond weed from the pencil box as well. The deed was all done, all was ready. Lavender put her pencils back into the rather damp pencil box and returned it to its correct place in her desk. Then she went out and joined the others in the playground until it was time for the lesson to begin. Chapter 13, the weekly test. At two o'clock the <clears throat> sharp, the class assembled, including Miss Honey, who noted the jug of water and the glass were in the proper place. Then she took up a position standing right at the back. Everyone waited. Suddenly in marched a gigantic figure, the headmistress in her belted smock and green breeches. Good afternoon, children, she barked. Good afternoon, Miss Trunchbull. They all chirped back. The headmistress stood before the class, legs apart, hands on hips, glaring at the small boys and girls who sat nervously at their desks in front of her. Not a very pretty sight, she said. Her expression was one of utter distaste as though she were looking at something a dog had done in the middle of the floor. What a bunch of nauseating little warts you are. Everyone had, a, had this good sense to stay silent. Ugh, it makes me vomit, she went on, to think that I'm going to have to put up with a load of you, for a uh, load of garbage like you in my school for the next six years. I can't see that I'm going to have to expel many of you as possible to save myself from going around the bend, she paused. She snorted several times, it was a curious noise, you can hear the same sort of snort when you walk through a riding stable when horses are being fed. I suppose, she went on, your mothers and fathers tell you you're wonderful. Well, I'm here to tell you the opposite and you better believe me. Stand up, everybody. <clears throat> they all quickly got to their feet. Now put your hands in front of you. As I walk past, I want you to turn them over so I can see if they are clean on both sides. So they have to show their hands here and here. The trench ball began slowly marching along the rows of desks, inspecting the hands. All went well until she came to a small boy in the second row. What's your name? She barked. Nigel, the boy said. Nigel what? Nigel Hicks? Nigel Hicks what? The trench ball bellowed. Um, that's it, Nigel said. Unless you want my middle name as well. He was a brave little fellow and one could see that he was trying to not be scared by the woman who towered above him. I, I do not want your middle names, you little blister. Little blister. What is my name? Miss Trunchbull. Then use it when you address me. Now then, let's try again. What is your name? 
Nigel Hicks, Miss Trunchbull, Nigel said. That's better, the Trunchbull said. Your hands are filthy, Nigel. When did you last wash them? Hmm, let me think, Nigel said. That's rather difficult to remember exactly. It would have been yesterday. Maybe even the day before. Ooh, the Trunchbull's whole body and face seemed to swell up as though she were being inflated like a bicycle pump. I knew it, she said. I knew as soon as I saw you that you were nothing but a piece of filth. What is your father's job, a sewage worker? No, he's a doctor, Nigel said, and a jolly good one. He says we're all so covered with bugs anyway that a bit of extra dirt never hurt anyone. Well, I'm glad he's not my doctor, the Trunchbull said. And why, might I ask, is there a baked bean on the front of your shirt? Well, we had them for lunch, Miss Trunchbull. And do you usually put your lunch on the front of your shirt, Nigel? Is that what the famous doctor father of yours has taught you? Well, baked beans are just hard to eat, Miss Trunchbull. They keep falling off my fork. You are disgusting, the Trunchbull bellowed. You are a walking germ factory. I do not wish to see any more of you today. Go stand in the corner on one leg with your face to the wall. But Miss Trunchbull, don't argue with me, boy, or I'll make you stand on your head. Now do as you're told. Nigel went. Now stay where you are, boy, while I test you on your spelling to see if you've learned anything at all this past week. And don't turn around and you talk to me. You keep your nasty little face to the wall. Now, can you spell right? Um, which one? Nigel asked. The thing you do with the pen. The one that means the opposite of wrong. Or, wait a minute. I read that wrong. Nigel asked, the thing that you do with a pen or the one that means the opposite of wrong? He happened to be an usually bright child and his mother had worked hard with him on spelling and reading. The one with a pen, you little fool. Nigel spelled it correctly, which surprised the trench bowl. She thought she had given him a very tricky word. One that he wouldn't have yet learned. She was a little peeved that he had succeeded. Then Nigel, still standing, balancing on one leg, facing the wall. Miss Honey taught us how to spell a very long word yesterday. And what word is that? The Trunchbull asked. The softer her voice became, the greater the danger. But Nigel wasn't to know this. Difficulty, Nigel said. Everyone in the class can spell difficulty now. Oh, what nonsense, the Trunchbull said. You are not supposed to learn long words like that until you're at least eight or nine. And don't try to tell me everybody in the class can spell that word. Word, You are lying, Nigel. Test someone, Nigel said. Oh, taking the awful chance. Test anyone you like. The trench ball's dangerous glittering eyes roved the classroom. You, she said, pointing to a tiny, rather daft little girl called Prudence, spelled difficulty. Amazingly, Prudence spelled it correctly. And without, oh, I'm so sorry, without a moment's hesitation. The trench bowl was properly taken aback. Hmm, <laughs> she snorted. And I suppose Miss Honey wasted the whole one lesson teaching you to spell one single word. Oh, no, she didn't, piped Nigel. Miss Honey taught us it in three minutes, so we'll never forget it. She teaches us lots of words in three minutes. And what exactly is this magic method, Miss Honey? Asked the headmistress. I'll show you, piped up the brave Nigel again, coming to Miss Honey's rescue. Can I put my other foot down and turn around, please, while I show you? You may do neither, snapped the trench ball. Stay as you are, show me just the same. All right, said Nigel. Wobbling crazily on his one leg, Miss Honey gives us a little song about each word and we sing it together. We learn to spell it in no time. Would you like to hear the song about difficulty? I should be fascinated, the trench ball said in a voice dripping with sarcasm. Well, here it is, Nigel said. Mrs. D, Mrs. I, Mrs. F, F, I, Mrs. C, Mrs. U, Mrs. L, T, Y. That spells difficulty. How perfectly ridiculous, snorted the trench ball. Why are all those women married? And anyway, you're not meant to teach poetry when you're teaching spelling. Cut it out in the future, Miss Honey. But it does teach them some of the harder words wonderfully well, Miss Honey murmured. Don't argue with me, Miss Honey, the headmistress thundered. Just do as you're told. I shall now test the class on the multiplication tables to see if Miss Honey has taught you anything at all in that direction. The trench ball had returned to her place in front of the class and her diabolical gaze was moving slowly along the rows of tiny pupils. You, she barked, pointing at a small boy, small boy called Rupert in the front row. What is two sevens? 16, Rupert, Rupert answered with foolish abandon. The trench ball started, advancing slow and soft-footed upon Rupert in a manner of a tigress stalking a small deer. Rupert suddenly became aware of the danger signals. It quickly tried again. It's 18, he cried. Two sevens are 18, not 16. Ugh, you ignorant little slug, the trench ball bellowed. You witless weed, you empty-headed hamster, you stupid glob of glue. 
She had now stationed herself directly behind Rupert, and suddenly she extended a hand the size of a tennis racket and grabbed the hair on Rupert's head in her fist. Rupert had a lot of golden colored hair his mother thought was beautiful to behold and took delight in allowing it to grow extra long. The Trunchbull had a great dislike for long hair on boys and she, as she had plates for and pigtails on girls and she was about to show it, she took a firm grip on Rupert's golden tresses and her giant hand. By raising her muscular arm, she lifted him helpless clean out of his chair and held him aloft. Rupert yelled, he twisted, he squirmed, and he kicked in the air and went on yelling like a stuck pig. Miss Trunchbull bellowed, two sevens are 14. Two sevens are 14. I'm not letting you go till you say it. From the back of the class, Miss Honey cried out, Miss Trunchbull, please let him down. You're hurting him. All his hair might come out. And it well might if he doesn't stop wiggling, snorted the Trunchbull. Keep still, you squirming little worm. It was really quite extraordinary to see this giant head mistress strangling a small boy high in the air and the boy spinning and twisting like something on the end of a string, shrieking his head off. Say it, bellowed the trench bowl. Say two sevens or 14. Hurry up or I'll start jerking you up and down and then your hair really will come out and we'll all have, we'll have enough of it to stuff a sofa. Get on with it, boy. Two sevens or 14. Two sevens or 14. 14, gasped Rupert, whereupon the trench bowl, true to her word, opened her hand and quite literally let him go. He was a long way off the ground when she released him and he plummeted to the earth and hit the floor and bounced like a football. Get up and stop whimpering, the trench bowl barked. Rupert got up and went back to his desk, his mask, mask, his, ugh, to his desk, massaging his scalp with both hands. The trench bowl returned to the front of the class. The children sat there hypnotized. None of them had seen anything quite like this before. It was splendid entertainment. It was better than pantomime, but with one big difference. In this room, there was an enormous human bomb in front of them, which was liable to explode and blow someone to bits at any moment. The children's eyes were riveted on the headmistress. I don't like small people, she was saying. Small people should never be seen by anyone. They should be kept out of sight in boxes like hairpins and buttons. I cannot for the life of me see why children have to take so long to grow up. I think they do it on purpose. Another extremely brave little boy in the front row spoke up and said, but surely you were a small person once, Miss Trunch Trunchbull, weren't you? I was never a small person, she snapped. I have been large all my life and I don't see why others can't be the same. But you must have started out as a baby, the boy said. Me, a baby, the Trunchbull shouted. How dare you suggest such a thing? What infernal insolence. What is your name, boy? And stand up when you speak to me, the boy stood up. My name is Eric Ink, Miss Trunchbull, he said. Eric what? The Trunchbull shouted. Ink, the boy said. Don't be stupid, boy. There's no such name. Look in the phone book, Eric said. You'll see my father there under Ink. Very well, then, the Trunchbull said. You may be Ink, young man, but let me tell you something. You're not indelible. I'll very soon rub you out of... Ugh. I'll very soon rub you out if you try getting clever with me. Spell what? I don't understand. Eric said, what do you want me to spell? Spell what, you idiot? Spell the word what? W-O-T, Eric said, answering too quickly. Oh, there was a nasty silence. I'll give you one more chance. The trench bowl said, not moving. Oh, yes, I know, Eric. It's got an H in it. W-H-O-T. It's easy. Oh boy, two large strides, the trench ball was behind Eric's desk, and there she stood, a pillar of doom towering over the helpless boy. Eric glanced fearfully back over his shoulder at the monster. I was right, wasn't I? He murmured, murmured nervously. You were wrong, the trench ball barked. And that, my friends, is where we'll leave off today. So we don't even get to find out this is perfect. This is so perfect, 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 perfect for a cliffhanger Friday. Sorry. Anyway, I hope you guys are have a good weekend and are starting to enjoy the sunshine and, and try to get outside and take a little walk. Um, and remember to look for kindness and to try to be kindness and, and look for the positive out there. During this time, it's negative. It's hard to see that. And I was reading something, trying to think of who said it. I'm drawing a blank. But look for the good things. There are good things going on too during this difficult time. 
and um, try to find something positive. We love you. We care about you. Have a great weekend. I'll see you Monday.